before Hitler learns of its departure, the British are tracking Bismarck's progress. Four days later, the battleship is located by the superior radar of the heavy cruiser Suffolk. Now the Royal Navy knows Bismarck is on the move, racing for the North Atlantic. HMS Hood and Prince of Wales are dispatched to intercept. By 5.45 on the morning of 24 May, the Hood and Prince of Wales have closed within 13 miles of Bismarck. Hood fires first. Bismarck immediately returns fire. The first shells strike the Hood's fused torpedoes at midships and she explodes. Of the ship's total company of 1,419, three survivors cling to life rafts in the icy water. Only one, Sigelman Ted Briggs, is alive today. I felt myself being dragged down and I was trying to get away. And the next thing I knew was I suddenly seemed, just seemed to shoot to the surface. When I came up, there wasn't another soul inside. I looked around and she was about 50 yards away and she was vertical with the water. And the bee turret was just going under. I panicked and I turned and swam as fast as I could away from her. And when I looked around again, she'd gone. She was a beautiful, proud ship, but unfortunately, with a glass jaw. HMS Hood's glass jaw was a function of her design. Armor had been sacrificed for speed. The next day, the victorious Bismarck, a hole in its bow from a shell fired from Prince of Wales, is short on fuel and heads directly for France. Ships right across the Atlantic converged towards the likely area of Bismarck. In some cases, without orders, they had to find Bismarck. They were going to sink that ship one way or another. 26 May, 1941, 10.30 a.m. A Catalina flying boat dives through the clouds for a better look at a huge ship below. It is met with a hail of gunfire from the Bismarck, trailing oil at 20 knots, less than 12 hours from freedom in France. But only 50 miles away is the British carrier Ark Royal. Within minutes, 15 of the Ark Royal's swordfish are in the air. Most of their torpedoes will miss, but one jams the Bismarck's rudder and plants the seeds of its destruction. Royal Navy battleships will finish the job. Bismarck died under very severe bombardment, was shot to pieces at close range. It was very bloody, and nearly 2,000 men died. It was a human tragedy. A very stout ship, slow death, hammered to pieces. In less than half an hour, the greatest German warship of all time rolls over and sinks. The victim of 400 shells, 15 well-placed torpedoes, and British resolve to revenge the hood. By the fall of 1945, after more than six years of the fiercest fighting the world has ever seen, all of Germany's battleships have been sunk, and Japan's monster battleship, her last hope for victory, is also at the bottom of the sea. World War II is over. The once mighty empire of Japan lies in ruin. President Harry Truman from Missouri prepares for peace. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government. In a he has determined that the unconditional surrender of Japan will take place most symbolically upon the deck of the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The Americans have come back to Japan to anchor very near the spot where in 1853 Commodore Matthew Perry anchored to demand that the Japanese open their nation to the West. The events of the day will be carefully documented. 
170 reporters, photographers, and radio sound men swarm the decks of the USS Missouri to record sounds and images that will be seen around the world for years to come. To this day, the battleship Missouri remains the most historic of all American battleships. For naval historian and battleship veteran Paul Stilwell, the Missouri is an heroic symbol for on her deck, one era ended and another began. And so it was on September 2nd, 1945, that General Douglas MacArthur came to this ladder at 9.01 on that Sunday morning while the Japanese were waiting for him to come down and accept the surrender of a proud but defeated nation. As the general walked forward, on his left was an American flag flown out from Annapolis for the ceremony. It had been on board Commodore Matthew Perry's flagship in Tokyo Bay in 1853. Farther to the left were dozens of American officers wearing khaki. The Japanese ahead of him were in top hats and morning coats. The Japanese looked up to this towering superstructure and saw hundreds of pairs of eyes boring down at them. There was an eerie silence on board the deck of the Missouri as General MacArthur came to the end of his walk. Standing just about here, his hand trembling slightly, at 9.02, he began a short speech looking beyond the war. We are gathered here to conclude a solemn agreement. At 9.04, Foreign Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu signed on behalf of the Japanese nation. Then the military representative. Then General MacArthur signed for the Allied powers. Finally, one by one, the representatives of the Allies came forward. Whereby these proceedings are closed. And so, on board a battleship, ended the greatest war in human history. Today, the Missouri remains the pinnacle of battleship design and technology. Still ready, it would seem, for another fight or yet another symbolic mission. On that infamous Sunday morning in 1941, Japan had sought to destroy every one of America's battleships in a single stroke. Yet here on the deck of a battleship, they surrendered without condition to the overwhelming force of the United States and her allies. living symbol of that force remains the battleship Missouri. Missouri Captain Lee Case. She is a ship with a heart and soul. And the soul of the ship has always been and always will be the past, present, and future sailors that serve on her. In peace and war, the tradition of the American battleship sailor grew large, enhanced by competition of every kind. They were like rival schools cheering on their own. Battleship sailors have long been a special breed. Perhaps because of the extraordinary teamwork required to man the guns and fight the ship, or the special symbolic nature of a battleship, or simply because they knew they were aboard the Navy's best, their ship became their home, and their home was a matter of pride. Between 1920 and 1941, America's fleet included up to 18 battleships that cruised the oceans of the world to train their crews and fly the flag, a powerful symbol that the American Navy was a genuine deterrent to any would-be aggressor. And among those pre-war American battleships was the USS North Carolina. Today, she rests as a state memorial in Wilmington, honoring the more than 10,000 North Carolinians who fought and died in World War II. To the USS North a visit aboard the North Carolina is a visit back in time. And as you begin it, let us tell you something about this giant of a ship. 
The North Carolina's engines could drive the ship at 27.